today we will discuss the development of brain in frog embryo so before going to the various processes involved in the development of frog brain we will just go to how uh, an adult frog brain looks like so here we have a diagram having the ventral dorsal and lateral views of frog brain where you can see the brain is differentiated into three regions this is the fore brain this is the mid brain and here you can see the hind brain and then it continues as the spinal cord so uh, the three uh, distinguished regions of the brain are fore brain mid brain and hind brain now we will go to the important parts of the fore brain these are the two cerebral hemispheres uh, and uh, the two cerebral hemispheres are well developed and this is considered to be the uh, most developed portion of the frog brain which is a part of the fore brain then connected to the cerebral hemispheres are two olfactory lobes uh, that is more evident in this diagram in the lateral view you can see the olfactory lobes so these two are the olfactory lobes and uh, this is the cerebral hemisphere here in this diagram this is the dorsal view where we can see the cerebral hemispheres and these are the olfactory lobes and there is a region which is wedged between the two cerebral hemispheres it is called as the diencephalon so these are the most important parts of the fore brain that is the cerebral hemispheres the olfactory lobes and the diencephalon the area wedged between the two cerebral hemispheres now we will come to the mid brain the mid brain consists of two optic lobes and they are collectively called as the corpora by gemina so this forms the mid brain now we come to the hind brain the hind brain consists of two parts that is the cerebellum and the medulla oblongata and it is the medulla oblongata which will continue as the spinal cord in the lateral view also you can see the cerebellum and medulla which are part of the hind brain now when we come to the ventral view what you can see in a uh, in an adult frog brain is uh, a prominent region is the optic chiasma so what is this optic chiasma Uh, the second cranial nerve of frog is called as the uh, optic nerve the optic nerve is coming from the eye and from the eye fr so from the eye the optic nerves they come to the uh, optic lobe of the brain you can see these two are the optic lobes so the uh, each optic nerve from the eye will come to the optic lobe but before they enter into the optic lobe from this side this is the uh, optic nerve that is a crane, second cranial nerve coming and this is the second cranial nerve coming from this eye but before entering into the optic lobe you can see that they are crossing with each other you can see they are crossing with each other and this cross point where the optic nerves cross between each other before they enter into the optic lobe is called as the optic chiasma and that is a feature which you can see in the fore brain of frog that is just uh, in the ventral region of the diencephalon so this is optic chiasma where the optic nerves from the eyes cross with each other before entering into the mid brain now on the ventral view you can also see from the floor of the uh, uh, the brain uh, you can see the floor of the diencephalon you can see the gland arising which is called as the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland has got a stalk from which it arises and that stalk is called as the infundibulum and we also have to study how the infundibulum develops so uh, from the when th so this is the diencephalon as i already told you this is the ventral region so from the ventral region of the diencephalon arises the pituitary gland so this these are the various important parts of adult frog brain and we will uh, discuss how they all develop we will also come to the cavities of frog brain so the cavities inside the brain are called as ventricles so here you can see this is the first these two are the first and second ventricles so they are also called as the lateral ventricles so you can consider this as the first ventricle and this as the second ventricle they are also called as the lateral ventricles or paraseal they are actually cavities found inside the cerebral hemisphere so these two are the cavities found inside the cerebral hemispheres so this is one cerebral hemisphere and this is the other cerebral hemisphere remember i told you these are the two cerebral hemispheres which are part of the forebrain and inside each cerebral hemisphere is a ventricle which is called as the lateral ventricle so these two are the lateral ventricles which are part of the cerebral hemispheres of the forebrain and you can also see that they are extending to the olfactory lobes 
where you can call them as olfactory seal or the olfactory ventricles. So, the lateral ventricles they will continue as the olfactory ventricles inside the olfactory lobe. Now, we come to the third ventricle. This is actually the region where the diencephalon is there. So, this is the cavity inside the diencephalon which is called as the third ventricle or the diaceal. The third ventricle or the diaceal. Now, uh, you can also see these two are the optic lobes. There are cavities inside the optic lobes, but they are very narrow and they, are, they can be considered as the optic ventricles or the optoceal since they are seen inside the optic lobes. Now, we will come to the fourth ventricle which is there inside the medulla oblongata. It is called as the metaceal which is there inside the medulla oblongata and uh, this metaceal or uh, you can also call it as the uh, rhomboceal because this is part of the hindbrain. Hindbrain is also called as rhombencephalon. So, this is the rhomboceal or the fourth ventricle and now what you can see is the fourth ventricle is connected to the third ventricle through a duct. So, this is the duct or the narrow cavity inside the midbrain. This is called as the aqueduct of sylvius or the iter. Aqueduct of sylvius or the iter which connects the fourth ventricle with the third ventricle. One more uh, uh, feature that is this is one lateral ventricle, this is the other lateral ventricle. They communicate to the third ventricle through openings. So, the openings through which the lateral ventricles communicate with the third ventricle. It is called as foramen of Monroe. So, this is the foramen of Monroe through which the first and the second ventricles communicate with the third ventricle. So, these are the ventricles of the frog brain. So, once more the forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain. Forebrain consists of the cerebral hemispheres, the olfactory lobes and the diencephalon. Midbrain consists of two optic lobes and the hindbrain consists of the cerebellum and the medulla oblongata and medulla continues as the spinal cord. On the ventral side of the brain, ventral to the diencephalon, you can see the two optic nerves, they cross with each other and these uh, point of crossing, it is called as the optic chiasma and just behind the optic chiasma, you can also see the pituitary gland arising from the floor of the diencephalon and the uh, stalk of the pituitary gland, it is called as the infundibulum. Now, we will just recall the, uh, recollect the cavities of the frog brain. They are the first and second ventricles which are seen inside the cerebral hemispheres. They are continuing to the olfactory lobes as the olfacto seal. Then this is the third ventricle which is seen inside the diencephalon and uh, the first and second ventricles communicate with the, di uh, with the third ventricle or the diaceal through the foramen of Monroe and uh, these two are the optoceals which are seen inside the optic lobes and this is the fourth ventricle or the rhomboceal which is there inside the hindbrain. The third ventricle and the fourth ventricle they communicate with each other through this duct which is called as the aqueduct of sylvius or it is also called as the iter and this fourth ventricle will continue towards the spinal cord as the spinal canal. Spinal canal is the central canal seen in the spinal cord and uh, all these spaces are filled with cerebrospinal fluid. So, remember this is a view of the adult brain. Now, we have to study how brain development takes place in frog. So, we will go to the following slides. So, brain is derived from the ectoderm. Remember during gastrulation it was discussed that the embryo uh, it will uh, get differentiated into three germ layers. They are the ectoderm, endoderm and the mesoderm and the brain is an ectodermal derivative. Brain is derived from the ectoderm and the formation of brain it involves two processes. First one, the first process is called as neurulation that is the formation of neural tube from the neurectoderm. So, the first process is now over which was earlier discussed. So, that process is called as neurulation uh, or the formation of the neural tube from the neurectoderm. Then uh, we will uh, just have a look at the uh, neural tube formation. You just uh, recollect the uh, what is the neural tube. So, it is uh, this process uh, which is called as neurulation where we earlier saw uh, the neural plate formation and the neural plate will form neural folds and finally it will become the uh, neural tube. So, you can see the embryonic stage where you will see the neural tube 
and it is from the anterior region of the neural tube that the brain develops. So the brain is differentiated from the anterior region of the neural tube. So the first process is the formation of this neural tube. So this is the neural tube which is formed on the dorsal side of the embryo. And the second process is the differentiation of the anterior part of neural tube into the brain. Now uh, what are the processes involved in the formation of brain? So as I already told you, it is from the anterior end of the neural tube that the brain is differentiated. So, this, uh, this is the anterior end of the neural tube. It is distinguished as encephalon. So, this region, this anterior end of the neural tube is called as the encephalon. It is this encephalon which will develop into various parts of the brain through thickening, thinning, evagination, invagination, etc. We will come through all of these processes. Uh, now, the encephalon it will divide into three distinct regions. The anterior most region is called as the prosencephalon which will give rise to the forebrain. The middle region is called as the mesencephalon which will differentiate into the midbrain. And the posterior region of the encephalon is called as the rhombencephalon which will differentiate into the hindbrain. So this is the anterior part of the neural tube called as the encephalon which will differentiate into the prosencephalon, mesencephalon and rhombencephalon which will eventually become the pro, um, forebrain, midbrain and hindbrain respectively. You can see cavities are there inside uh, each of these. They can be called as the prosocial, mesocial and rhombocele. Now we first come to the prosencephalon. This prosencephalon, it will further constrict, it will undergo further constriction to form an anterior telencephalon and a posterior diencephalon. So this region, it is called as the telencephalon. So this region, this anterior region of the prosencephalon is called as a telencephalon and there is a posterior region which is called as the diencephalon. So you can see here, this is the diencephalon. So this region of the forebrain is the diencephalon and this region of the forebrain is called as the telencephalon. The anterior part is telencephalon. It is also called as the end brain and this is the second part is called as the diencephalon. Now we will come to another diagram where you can see the, so this is a one view. Uh, this is a, a lateral view of a frog embryo, the anterior region of the em frog embryo in its lateral view. You can see it is a lateral section where uh, this part is the encephalon where this region is the prosencephalon. This region is the, uh, th this part is the um, mesencephalon and uh, this region is the uh, met um, rhombencephalon. So the forebrain region, the midbrain region and the hindbrain region and finally it will lead to the spinal cord. So forebrain then midbrain and hindbrain. Uh, this part is the telencephalon and uh, this second part is the diencephalon. This is the uh, mesencephalon and this is the rhombencephalon. So we come back to the prosencephalon which is differentiated into the uh, telencephalon and the diencephalon. So at the posterior region of the prosencephalon, the brain is actually undergoing a bend. You can see here. So this is the notochord. You can see this tissue, it is the notochord. The formation of notochord was also discussed earlier. So this is the notochord. But you can see the brain is extending again beyond the notochord. You can see here, here. So this is the notochord ends here. But the brain is extending beyond the notochord where it is undergoing a bend. You can see it is bending ventrally. So this is the brain which is progressing along with the notochord. But after the notochord it is undergoing a bending. Okay, this bend, this bend is called as the cranial flexure. So this bend is called as the cranial flexure which is a feature of the vertebrate brain. So it is a prominent feature of the vertebrate brain. That is this bend which the brain undergoes anteriorly beyond the notochordal region. You have another diagram. This is the notochord. This is the brain and after the notochord you can see it is undergoing a prominent bending. 
So this bending is called as the cranial flexure. Now we come back to this diagram. And at the flexure region, you can see a thickening. There is a thickened region at the cranial flexure, this thickened region. This thickened region, it is called as the tuberculum posterior. So this is the tuberculum posterior. So this is the tuberculum posterior, which is the uh, thickening, the thickened area, um, which is seen at the region of the cranial flexure. So uh, this actually marks the posterior limit of the forebrain. That is the forebrain ends at the tuberculum posterior. That is why it is called as the tuberculum posterior. So this marks the end of the forebrain. This marks the ventral end of the forebrain. So this region is called as the tuberculum posterior. Now we come to the anterior region. Anterior region of the telencephalon. The anterior region of the telencephalon is somewhat thickened. So this thickening. So this is the anterior region of the telencephalon which is a thickened area. This thickened area is called as the lamina terminalis. So this thickening is called as lamina terminalis which marks the anterior region of the forebrain. We can see it through this diagram here, this thickening. So this thickening at the anterior region is called as the lamina terminalis. Don't get confused by these two diagrams because uh, this is pointing towards the uh, left side and uh, this is pointing towards your right side but anyway this part is the forebrain you can see this is the lamina terminalis and this is the tuberculum posterior you can see this is the tuberculum posterior at the region of the cranial flexure this is the lamina terminalis so the anterior boundary of the forebrain is marked by this thickening called as the lamina terminalis and the posterior boundary is marked by the tuberculum posterior it is this lamina terminalis so you know that this is the anterior region, this is the telencephalon. So it is at the telencephalon that the cerebral hemispheres will form as we already discussed. Here you can see the cerebral hemispheres are actually part of the telencephalon. Okay. And uh, uh, we uh, I already told you this lamina terminalis is the anterior boundary of the uh, telencephalon. And this uh, t uh, lamina terminalis will uh, in future it will separate the two cerebral hemispheres. So the two cerebral hemispheres in future will be separated by this lamina terminalis and it is seen in the form of a longitudinal groove. So you can see the two cerebral hemispheres are separate. You can, deem, you can distinguish as the right cerebral hemisphere and the left cerebral hemisphere. Uh, it is uh, due to the presence of a groove in between them and this groove is formed from this lamina terminalis. Now we will come back to the uh, development again. So as I already told you this is the uh, term uh, uh, telencephalon and the telencephalon during development. So initially it was this, this stage and later it uh, assumes this shape where the telencephalon it will differentiate into a pair of vesicles and these two vesicles are called as the telencephalic vesicles which will form the cerebral hemispheres later. So these two are the telencephalic vesicles. You can see this is the initial uh, structure of the brain in frog but later it differentiates into a structure like this where the forebrain differentiates into the telencephalon and the diencephalon and the telencephalon will differentiate into a pair of vesicles which are called as the telencephalic vesicles which will form the cerebral hemispheres. And inside each cerebral hemisphere is a cavity which is called as the telocele or the lateral ventricle that was discussed earlier. So the cavities inside the cerebral hemispheres are called as the lateral ventricles and since they are part of the telencephalon it is called as the telocele or the lateral ventricle. Now, now we will uh, come to uh, uh, again we come to this diagram. So here uh, this region, the anterior region is called as lamina terminalis as I already told you. So this is the lamina terminalis as I already told you and uh, this region has got a roof. There is a thickened roof uh, for each cerebral hemisphere. You consider each cerebral hemisphere to be a room. You consider them to be two rooms and each cerebral hemisphere is having a thick roof and this roof is called as the cortex or the pallium. 
the roof is called as the cortex or the pallium. Now we also consider the floor and uh, the walls. So imagine the cerebral hemispheres to be two rooms. The anterior boundary we saw there is the lamina terminalis. So anterior region of the room you can consider is coated with the lamina is having a coating which you can imagine as a lamina terminalis. Then so you are imagining a room the anterior boundary anterior wall is the lamina terminalis. The roof is the uh, cortex or the pallium. The floor as well as the side walls the thickened floor as well as the side walls. It is called as corpora striata, singular corpus striatum, plural corpora striata. Since there are two cerebral hemispheres, they are called as the corpora striata. So corpora striata are the, uh, they form the, uh, the floor as well as the, the ventral uh, floor as well as the ventrolateral sides of the cerebral hemispheres. Now. Now as I already told you, from the anterior ventral part of the telencephalon, a pair of evaginations arise. It is not very prominent in this diagram, but we come to this diagram again. And the uh, two evaginations which arise from the telencephalon are the olfactory lobes. And uh, you can see they are fused, they are in fused condition. The two olfactory lobes are in fused condition, they are not remaining separate. They are the olfactory lobes, they arise from the telen cephalon. And there are nerves arising from the olfactory lobes and uh, these two nerves are called as the olfactory nerves. They are the first cranial nerves or the olfactory uh, nerves. And uh, uh, where do they um, come from? They are coming from the nasal epithelium. The nasal epithelium which is developing from a tissue which is called as the olfactory placard. So they are coming from the nasal epithelium. These two nerves are coming from the nasal epithelium. They are the first cranial nerves or the olfactory nerves which come to the olfactory lobes of the brain. So the olfactory lobes receive them. They are coming from the nasal epithelium. Okay. So this is also a part of the telencephalon. And as I already told you, the two cavities which extend up to the uh, olfactory lobes can be called as the olfactory seals. So this is regarding the uh, telen cephalon. Now we will come to the uh, second part which is called as the diencephalon. So this is all regarding the telen cephalon where the cerebral hemispheres are there arising from the cerebral hemispheres are the olfactory lobes. They have cavities called as the olfactory seal. They receive uh, one nerve each from the nasal placard. They are called as the olfactory nerves or the uh, first cranial nerves. Second cranial nerve as we already uh, discussed the optic nerves that we will discuss again when we come to the diencephalon. Now, now the third that is the diencephalon. Diencephalon is the uh, posterior region of the forebrain. Anterior region of the forebrain is the telencephalon and the posterior region of the forebrain is the diencephalon. So there is a cavity inside the diencephalon. This is the cavity inside the diencephalon. It is called as the diaceal, which we already saw through this diagram. This is the cavity inside the diencephalon. There are different views. So this is the cavity inside the diencephalon. It is called as the third ventricle or the diaceal. In this diagram, this is the diaceal because this is a cavity inside the uh, diencephalon. This is the third ventricle. And as I already told you, the lateral ventricles communicate with the third ventricle through the foramen of Monroe. These two are the lateral ventricles of the cerebral hemispheres. They communicate with the third ventricle through the foramen of Monroe. Now, now we have to take a detailed look at the uh, uh, formation of the uh, parts of diencephalon. So we will come to that. This uh, diencephalon, in the floor of the diencephalon, so we will come to the diencephalon in the so this is the diencephalon this part is the diencephalon in the floor of the diencephalon so this is the floor of the diencephalon you can see you can see a vesicle a vesicle like evagination arises from the floor of the diencephalon 
So this is the tuberculum posterior as we already mentioned, just anterior to the tuberculum posterior. From the floor of the diencephalon or from the floor of the diacele, you can see a sac like or a pouch like or a vesicle like evagination arising. So this evagination, this evagination, it is called as the infundibulum. You can see here, look. So this is the infundibulum. So it, where is it arising from? It is arising from the floor of the diencephalon. So this is the diencephalon. It is arising from the floor of the diencephalon just anterior to the tuberculum posterior. So it is called as the infundibulum. At the same time, at the same time, from the roof of the stomodium, another structure grows towards the infundibulum. It is called as the hypophysis. So for that we will go to another diagram. That is, we will go to another diagram. So again we will come here. This is the mouth mouth leads to the buccal cavity which will lead to the pharynx. So this part, so from this part, this uh, pharyngeal region of the stomodium, just so uh, as we already mentioned, this is the infundibulum. This is the infundibulum which is arising as an evagination from the diencephalon floor. At the same time, from this uh, pharyngeal region of the stomodium, an invagination will grow towards the infundibulum. This invagination, it will form a cluster of cells. This cluster of cells is called as the rat case pocket. Rat case pocket or the hypophysis. So it is actually forming from the roof of the stomodium. It is arising uh, opposite to the area or it is uh, growing towards this infundibulum. It is arising as an invagination and it is growing towards the infundibulum. It initially appears as a pouch of cells. It is called as the hypophysis of the rat case pouch. So for a, a closer look, I will take you to another diagram that is here. Here, uh, this is the infundibulum. This is the infundibulum and uh, this is the rat case pouch which has arisen from the stomodium. So this is the rat case pouch because the uh, pharynx is down here and from this pharynx has developed, from the stomodial region has developed a pouch which is growing towards the infundibulum and this pouch is called as a rat case pouch or the hypophysis. It will now, it has now separated from the stomodium. Uh, actually it has arisen from the stomodium which was present here but now it is separated from the roof of the stomodium. It forms a vesicle, it moves towards the infundibulum, fuses with the infundibulum and forms a part of it and now this becomes the pituitary gland. So actually the infundibulum is arising from the diencephalon whereas the pituitary is arising from the roof of the stomodium but they fuse with each other and finally what happens? You can see the pituitary uh, as a growth from this diencephalon and it is held by a stalk called as the infundibulum. So we will just go to the first diagram which we saw that is this is the pituitary gland where is it arising from the diencephalon and it is held to the diencephalon with the help of a stalk called as infundibulum. Actually infundibulum has grown from the diencephalon, pituitary has grown from the roof of the stomodium which will later fuse with the infundibulum. So hope you understood the formation of the pituitary. So um, the floor of the diencephalon develops an evagination called as the infundibulum and the roof of the stomodium develops an invagination called as the hypophysis or the rat case pouch. This uh, hypophysis will soon separate from the stomodium, fuse with the infundibulum and forms the pituitary gland. And now eventually what happens? The pituitary arises as a growth from the ventral region of the diencephalon held by the stalk called as the infundibulum. So hope it is clear to you. Uh, this pituitary has got uh, three regions, the anterior pituitary, uh, the pituitary has got two regions, the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. Uh, actually the cells of the posterior pituitary arise from the infundibulum 
and the uh, cells of the anterior pituitary uh, they arise from the hypophysis. So, it is actually the hypophysis which will give rise to the cells of the anterior pituitary and the cells of the infundibulum give rise to the posterior pituitary. Anyway, the pituitary is now seen as a growth from the ventral growth from the diencephalon which is held by the infundibulum. Infundibulum has grown from the diencephalon and pituitary has grown from the roof of the stomodium which later separates from the stomodium and forms that gland. And the cells of the infundibulum give rise to the cells of posterior pituitary and the cells of the hypophysis will give rise to the anterior pituitary. Now, we will come back to this diaceal. So, this is the diaceal which is the cavity inside the diencephalon which is also called as the third ventricle. In the uh, roof of the diaceal, so here this is the diaceal, as I told you this is the diaceal, this is the diaceal, this is the cerebral hemisphere. In this diagram it is seen as closed, you can see here the cerebral hemisphere is closed and uh, on the roof of the diaceal an area becomes non-nervous that means it is no more nervous in nature but it becomes highly vascular what do you mean by vascular richly supplied with blood vessels and it becomes very folded into finger like processes and they are extending to this diaceal so an area on the roof of the diaceal becomes thin non-nervous vascular and folded into finger like projections it is called as the anterior choroid plexus so this is called as the anterior choroid plexus which will produce the cerebrospinal fluid the anterior choroid plexus produces the cerebrospinal fluid now now one more feature so here uh, the same diagram which I showed you, this is the infundibulum, this is the pituitary and it is arising from the floor of the diaceal. Arising from the roof of the diencephalon, just behind this anterior choroid plexus, arising from the roof of the diencephalon, you can see a sac like outgrowth, you can see here, this is called as the epiphysis. Look, this is the epiphysis which ar is arising from the roof of the diencephalon and uh, it will separate from the brain and it appears as a small knob of cells and this is called as the brow spot of adult frog, brow spot of the adult frog which is seen as a mark left behind after the skull development in frog. So, this is called as the brow spot or it is corresponding to the pineal gland in higher vertebrates. It is considered to be homologous to the pineal gland in higher vertebrates. So, it is arising from the roof of the diencephalon just anterior to the anterior, just behind the anterior choroid plexus. It is uh, called as the brow spot which is a mark left behind after the skull development in frog and it is homologous to the pineal gland in higher vertebrates. Now, now we will come to the optic chiasma. I told you the optic chiasma is the region where the uh, the optic nerves cross with each other it is actually at this region that is in front of the infundibulum you can see the optic chiasma we will go to the other diagram that would be better so this is a side view this is a section but we will go to the original diagram where you can see the optic chiasma look here this is the diencephalon region this is the infundibulum this is the pituitary arising from the infundibulum it is just in front of the infundibulum that the nerves cross with each other this region is called as optic chiasma. So, when you have a lateral view, you have the optic chiasma here that is in front of the infundibulum, you have the optic chiasma. So, you have to connect through all diagrams. Uh, and what is optic chiasma? The sensory nerves that is optic nerves coming from the sensory portion of the eye before entering into the brain will cross over each other. Now, just in front of this optic chiasma, there is a small depression it is called as the optic recess look the optic recess and uh, in front of the optic recess there is a thickening which is called as torus transversus so in this diagram this is the optic recess this is the optic recess and in front of the optic recess is a thickening called as the torus transversus 
we are going through many diagrams so that you can understand uh, all the terms mentioned here. So, uh, this is the infundibulum, this is the infundibulum, this is the pituitary going to be attached to the infundibulum, the hypophysis which is going to be attached to the infundibulum, this is an uh, uh, this is not an advanced diagram, but uh, growing stage only that is you can see the hypophysis arising from the stomodium going to be attached to the infundibulum. Just in front of the infundibulum you have the optic recess, uh, you have the optic chiasma, optic recess and the thickening called as the torus transversus. So, this is all regarding the forebrain formation. So, various terms we came across are we will just have a look at that. That is the um, forebrain is just differentiated into the telencephalon and the diencephalon. The telencephalon and the diencephalon. The telencephalon uh, develops into uh, telencephalic vesicles which will develop into the cerebral hemispheres. This uh, bending of the forebrain just beyond the notochord is the cranial flexure. There is a thickening called as the tuberculum posterior at the cranial flexure. The uh, went through the cavities inside the brain, the two lateral ventricles, the foramen of Munro, the third ventricle of the diacyl, then the roof is called as the cortex, the uh, ventrolateral walls are called as the corpora striata, then we saw the olfactory lobes, then we saw the uh, infundibulum arises from the floor of the diencephalon how the pituitary or the hypophysis is formed from the roof of the stomodium, how they fuse with each other. Then we saw the optic chiasma, the optic chiasma, in front of the optic chiasma you saw the optic recess and the uh, torus transversus. So, these are some of the terms which we saw in the development of the forebrain. Now, we will come to the development of midbrain or the mesencephalon. So, this is the mesencephalon region. The later during development, the walls, the dorsolateral walls, that means the dorsal as well as the side walls of this mesencephalon will bulge out as a pair of optic lobes. Look, you can see they are bulging out. The dorsolateral walls are bulging out as a pair of optic lobes, and since there are two, it is called as corpora bigemina. But in very advanced vertebrates, there will be four lobes two optic lobes and two auditory lobes, they are called as corpora quadrigemina. But you can see in frog there are only two optic lobes in the midbrain, it is called as the corpora bigemina and this is separated by a median fissure, the two corpora bigemina, the two optic lobes are separated by a median fissure. Now if you consider them to be two rooms, the floor and sides of the midbrain are thickened into tracts of grey matter. What is grey matter? Grey matter in uh, nervous system is a region where the cell bodies of neurons are concentrated. We have already learned about the structure of a neuron where there is a central nucleus containing region, cytoplasmic containing region called as the cell body and many branches called as the dendrons as well as a single axon. So, when you have a cluster of neurons, there will be regions where the cell bodies cluster together. Uh, that region is called as the grey matter and so when you consider optic lobes to be two chambers, the floor as well as the sides of the uh, of midbrain, they are thickened into tracts of grey matter and they are called as the crura cerebri. So, they are called as crura cerebri, that means the uh, midbrain is having thickenings and uh, these thickenings, these thickenings are called as the crura cerebri. They form the uh, floor as well as the sides of the uh, midbrain. Here you cannot uh, see any marking, but anyway, when you consider the midbrain, uh, ah, here, here you can see this is the floor of the midbrain. The sides also is thickened, it is called as the crura cerebri. So, here you can see the crura cerebri. And they actually function as pathways which will connect the forebrain and the hindbrain because they consist of collection of neurons. So, they form uh, path, connection pathways between the forebrain and the mid, um, hindbrain. Now, the cavity inside this uh, uh, optic lobe or the mesencephalon is called as a mesocele. This cavity is called as a mesocele. 
and it is very narrow because the walls and roof are thickened and uh, this forms the connection between the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle here i take you to this diagram again here so the sides are thickened and this is the cavity inside the midbrain and it is actually connecting the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle and this is called as the ite or the aqueductus sylvius aqueductus sylvius or the ite and these are cavities seen inside the optic lobe so this is actually the central cavity of the midbrain which is connecting the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle now so this is all regarding the mesencephalon so the mesencephalon consists of two bulges which will develop into the two optic lobes which is collectively called as the corpora bigemina and there are thickenings on the floor as well as the sides of the midbrain they are called as the crura cerebri they are collections of gray matter they establish connection between the forebrain and the hindbrain and uh, the central cavity is called as the ite or the meso seal or the narrow meso seal or the aqueducto sylvius which will connect the diaseal and the fourth ventricle so this is all regarding the mesencephalon then we come to the fourth vent uh, the third part of the brain which is the rhombencephalon or the hind brain and uh, there is a constriction here you have a constriction which is demarcating the uh, mid brain from the hind brain we will go to other diagrams where you can see here this constriction you can see this constriction which is separating the mid brain and the hind brain and uh, what happens is the develops a thickening on the roof of this hind brain this thickening will later differentiate into the cerebellum it is this thickening the transverse thickening which is developing on the roof of the hind brain or the rhombencephalon it is this thickening that which develops into the cerebellum cerebellum then just behind the cerebellum the roof of the hind brain again becomes broad thin vascular non nervous just like this anterior choroid plexus the there is an area in on the roof of the hind brain just behind the cerebellum which will become broad thin vascular non nervous it is called as the posterior choroid plexus so it is similar to the anterior choroid plexus in its function that is it helps in the development of cerebrospinal fluid so this is the roof where a transverse thickening develops into cerebellum now the ventral region as well as the sides the ventrolateral sides of the hind brain or the rhombencephalon give rise to the medulla oblongata and the cavity inside the rhombencephalon or the rhombocele is called as the fourth ventricle it connects Uh, anteriorly uh, to the third ventricle through this ite and posteriorly it will get connected to the spinal canal of the spinal cord so this is the last part of the brain then it is the spinal cord which continues so there is a canal inside the spinal cord called as the spinal canal so this fourth ventricle is continuing as the spinal canal so once again the rhombencephalon or the hind brain uh, it is demarcated from the mid brain by a constriction a transverse thickening develops on the roof of the rhombencephalon which will differentiate into cerebellum behind the cerebellum is the uh, vascular and non nervous posterior choroid plexus the floor as well as the ventrolateral walls of the rhombencephalon give rise to the medulla oblongata and it will continue as the spinal canal so we will once again have a last look at the brain of frog where the fore brain with cerebral hemispheres olfactory lobes and diencephalon can be seen the mid brain with the two optic lobes can be seen the hind brain with the transverse thickening on the roof developing into the cerebellum and the ventrolateral walls developing into the medulla so this is all regarding the formation of frog brain thank you